Sri Sukhandar Sagar Rai to move the bill further to amend the Constitution of India to be taken into consideration. Sukhandar Thank Sagar you, sir. Roy. Sir. Member has withdrawn. Yeah, he is withdrawn. Sir, I deeply obliged. No, no, bill is withdrawn. That after six and a half years of my tenure in Rajya Sabha, I have got the opportunity to present my bill on the constitutional amendment, that is the amendment of Article 366 for insertion of Clause 5, capital A, thereunder. What is this all about? Sir, at the outset, I would like to say that in our constitution, many words and expressions have been properly defined. But under Article 366, but the word consultation has not been defined in our constitution. As a result of which, a lot of controversy and conflict has taken place in this country over the years. So when I am presenting this bill in this house, August House, I am appalled to know from a press conference held by senior functionaries of a constitutional institution inviting the attention of the people that rot has been created in the highest body of a particular constitutional institution and the nation cannot avoid to address this problem. And in a democracy, since will of the people is supreme, and this will is not only expressed in the preamble to the Constitution of India, but from time to time this will of the people is reflected through the discussions, deliberations of the elected representatives of the people. So now it is a humble duty on the part of the elected representatives of the people in both houses of parliament to address this serious development which has taken place very recently or maybe for a long time that transparency is absent and some nepotism is going on in a particular constitutional institution and we shall have to address that problem. Now, sir, this amendment bill, through this amendment bill, I propose to insert article, I propose to insert one clause 5A under article 306 so that the meaning of consultation should be only the action or process of formally consulting or discussing with another in a merely consultative, no, advisory, no, no, no. and non-binding manner. What prompted me to bring this constitutional amendment bill? In support of this, I would like to place a few points before you, sir, to this house, through you, sir, <coughs> that in our constitution, in a number of articles, the heavy word consultation has been used number of articles, like Article 124, Article 217, Article 127, Article 222, etc., etc. Now, taking advantage of absence of a proper definition of the word consultation, I have already stated that on a number of occasions, these provisions of the Constitution have been misutilized, misinterpreted to the benefit of certain quarters, which I do not want to name, but everybody can understand. Now, sir, <coughs> it is for this reason that the term consultation requires to be defined in the Constitution. And this definition should not have any ambiguity. There should not have any ambiguity. Now, what, why I am pressing for this amendment? Sir, so come first come to Article 124 of the Constitution. Please come to 124 of the Constitution. It says, 
it says inter alia that I quote there shall be a Supreme Court of India consisting of a Chief Justice of India and until Parliament by law prescribes a larger number not more than seven other judges etc. Now there is a proviso to article 124 that proviso says and I quote provided that in the case of appointment of a judge other than the Chief Justice the Chief Justice of India shall always be consulted. Here lies the problem. Previously there was no problem, it was going on. On the, on the basis of ordinary dictionary meaning of the word of consultation, things were moving for a long period. But suddenly, suddenly it was derailed. Why? There is a historical background of this. The Supreme Court in the matter of ad, Supreme Court Advocates on Record Association versus Union of India, India year 93, 1993 and its advisory opinion given in the year 1998 in the third judge's case on a reference being made by the, made to the Supreme Court by the then President of India under his constitutional powers had interpreted sub-article, sub uh, sub-plus two of Article 124 and Clause 1 of Article 217 of the Constitution with respect to the meaning of consultation as concurrence. So from 1993, the scenario suddenly changed. And thereafter also, this Parliament unanimously enacted a constitutional amendment bill, passed the constitutional amendment bill and enacted the National Judicial Appointment Commission, which was again set aside by the Apex Court on the ground of that interpretation that consultation means concurrence, which as a student of political science and law, I am with all respect to that judgment, I beg to defer. What was the, what was in the mind of the founder fathers of the Constitution? I would like to refer from the Constitution a few lines, sir, because that is very important. Those who manned the Constituent Assembly were not ordinary people. They were much learned people than today's learned people. Sir, on, tw on 29th of July 1947, on 29th July of 1947, this matter was discussed threadbare at length by different leaders in the Constituent Assembly. And I refer, I would like to refer a few lines from volume four of the Constitution, Constituent Assembly debates. I have not brought, I have a, this parliamentary publication of five volumes I am having with me, like on, uh, many other members. Here, sir, the clause 18 was introduced in chapter four of the Constitutional Amendment debates, uh, Constituent Assembly debates. And see, Allah the Krishna Shami Ayar of Madras General, he moved this clause 18, and it says in Taralaya, and I quote, a judge of the Supreme Court shall be appointed by the President after consulting the Chief Justice and such other judges of the Supreme Court, as also such judges of the High Courts as may be necessary for the purpose. <coughs> This was the original clause or article which was moved in the Constituent Assembly by Sri Alladi Krishna Shami And from there the discussion started and it continued for the entire day and thereafter. And many members, they participated. And what other members said, one by one, one, two, three line I say, what would like to say, a quote, said, Sivan Lal Saksena. Mr. Swami was referring his name in context of another bill, his bill. That SL Saxena, he said, and I quote, I have in this amendment, he moved an amendment, amendment and said, in this amendment, I have provided that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court shall be appointed by the President, but it shall be confirmed by at least two-third majority of both the houses. Different view was expressed by this gentleman, 
And now, sir, another member of the Constituent Assembly, B. Pokar Shahid Bahadur, what he said? He said that I move that for Clause 2 and for past proviso of Clause 2 of Article 103, the following be substituted. Every judge of the Supreme Court, other than the Chief Justice of India, shall be appointed by the President by warrant under his hand and seal after consultation with the concurrence of the Chief Justice of India. He advocated for concurrence of the Chief Justice of India, not only consultation. So again, there is a different view. But ultimately, when their divergent views were expressed by various members in the Constituent Assembly, I don't want to proceed further, but one or two lines from some of the members, I would like to say, it was said, if a, I quote, if a judge owes his appointment to a political party, certainly in the course of his career as a judge, or as an ordinary human being, he will certainly be bound to have some consideration for the political views of the authority that has appointed him. That the judges should be above all these political considerations cannot be denied. Therefore, I submit that one of the chief conditions mentioned in the procedure laid down, that is the concurrence of the Chief Justice of India in the appointment of the judges of the Supreme Court must be fulfilled. So he went on saying, why this concurrence is required? No mere consultation will not do. Concurrence is required. And he said that this should be accepted by the House. Then another member, Mr. Katie Shah, she said, my amendment seeking to make the appointment of judges free from any particular influence. My amendment is that the president, if he makes the appointment, will naturally do so on the advice of the prime minister. In my opinion, sir, if I may so, with all respect, this constitution concentrates so much power and influence in the hands of the prime minister in regard to the appointment of judges, ambassadors, governors, etc., etc. Again, a different view. Das Bhargava, another honorable member of the Constituent Assembly, he supported the amendment saying, confirmation of the appointment of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court must be made by a two-thirds majority of the total number of members of parliament <coughs> assembled in a joint session of both houses of parliament. So, is another view that this should be done, this should be approved by the two-third majority of the members assembled in a joint session of the parliament. So the discussion was going on at length. And what happened ultimately? What happened ultimately? Out of those discussions, somebody said, that this is the formula. They said, no, 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 the another formula. The third formula, fourth formula, ultimately we are Ambedkar. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the main architect of the Constitution and the chairman of the draft, uh, the draft committee, he said it should be taken as a concluding part of the debate. Now, sir, quote, now, sir, with regard to the numerous amendments that have been moved to this article, there are really three issues that have been raised. He has summarized three issues on the question of consultation or concurrence or two-third majority parliament to pass, etc., etc. Three issues framed. The first is, how are the judges of the Supreme Court to be appointed? This is the first issue. Now, proving the different amendments that are related to this particular matter, I find three different proposals. I mean, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, not me. <laughs> the first proposal is that the judges of the Supreme Court should be appointed with the concurrence of the Chief Justice. That was one view. I have already stated. The other view is that the appointments made by the president should be subject to the confirmation of two-thirds vote by parliament. And the third suggestion is that they should be appointed in consultation with the Council of States. Because somebody is, uh, suggested for that they should be consulted. This house, this house, Council of States, should be consulted. So there are various suggestions. These three issues 
or suggestion that he, Mr. Ambedkar referred to. Then Mr. Ambedkar continued, there can be no difference of opinion in the House that our judiciary must both be independent of the executive and in the Constitution there is, a, uh, there is an article that the judiciary under uh, 48, Article 48, that the judiciary should be separated from the executive. We have already adopted. Now, sir, <clears throat> that our judiciary must be both, be both be independent of the executive and must also be competent in itself. And the question is how these two objectives would be secured. See, it is not only to be independent. Judiciary is not only to be independent, but it should also be competent in itself. That is the moot question. How the judiciary can achieve to be competent in itself? Through nepotism, through high-handedness, it cannot be. Therefore, what Dr. Ambedkar suggested, there are two different ways in this matter is in this matter is governed in other countries. In Great Britain, the appointments are made by the Crown without any kind of limitation whatsoever, which means by the executive of the day. There is an opposite system in the United States where, for instance, officers of the Supreme Court as well as other officers of the state shall be made only with the concurrence of the Senate in the United States. So Dr. Ambedkar referred to Great Britain, referred to United States, how the judges and other officials of the Supreme Court are appointed. It seems to me, Dr. Ambedkar says, it seems to me in the circumstances in which we live today, where the sense of responsibility has not grown to the same extent to which we find it in the United States, it would be dangerous to leave the appointments to be made by the President without any kind of reservation or limitation, that is to say merely on the advice of the executive of the day. He also advocated that no, there should not be any unflinching power to the President for the appointment of the Supreme Court judges. There must be some restriction because we have not emerged as a nation to the height of United Nations. Indirectly, he wanted to say that, if I have correctly understood the purpose and meaning of what he has said. Now, sir, he, again he says, similarly, it seems to me that to make a pre appointment that the executive wishes to make subject to the concurrence of the legislature is also not a very suitable provision. That is neither, that is desirable, nor this is also desirable that for every, every appointment, the executive will have to seek approval of the parliament. That is also not desirable. Then what is desirable and what should be done in between as a balancing act or a compromising act? That is, he says, and he prescribed for, advocated for, <clears throat> that apart from its being cumbrous, it, is also, it also involves the possibility of the appointment being influenced by political pressure and political consideration. The draft article, that is Article 18, which says, I have read in the, at the outset, that with the, in, in consultation with the Chief Justice, the judges will be appointed by the President under his hand and seal. The draft article, therefore, <coughs> steers a middle course. The draft article, therefore, steers a middle course. It does not make the President the supreme and the absolute authority in the matter of making appointments. It does not also impose the influence of the legislature. The provision in the article is that there should be consultation of persons. There should be consultation of persons who are ex hypothesis well qualified to give proper advice in matters of this sort. And my judgment is that this sort of provision may be regarded as sufficient for the moment. And he continued. 
with regard to the question of the concurrence of the Chief Justice, he dealt with this part very widely. With regard to the question of the concurrence of the Chief Justice, it seems to me that those who advocate that proposition seem to rely implicitly both on the impartiality of the Chief Justice and the soundness of his judgment. I personally feel no doubt that the Chief Justice is a very eminent person, but after all, the Chief Justice is a man with all the failings, all the sentiments, and all the prejudices which we as common people have. So it is not a great human being or a greater human being. The Chief Justice is also a human being like all other human beings, which Mr. Ambedkar tried to propagate and convince the members of the Constituent Assembly very successfully. And he continued, <clears throat> I, I think to allow the Chief Justice practically a veto upon the appointment of judges is really to transfer the authority to the Chief Justice, which we are not prepared to vest in the President or the government of the day. So the absolute authority, neither this constituent assembly wants to give to the President or to the legislature, even not to the Chief Justice. Therefore, there should be a balance, a consulting process. And democracy requires discussion. Democracy requires consultation. Democracy requires debate and thereafter approval. Therefore, this Mr. Ambedkar ruled out the phrasing of concurrence in the process of consultation for appointment of judges in the, either in the Supreme Court or in the High Court. Unfortunately, unfortunately, after following this procedure over the decade suddenly, in 1993, all of us know what happened and how it happened. And India is the only country in the world where judges appoint judges. Nowhere in the world. In Switzerland, the Federal Assembly, they appoint the judges of the Federal Court. This parliament never sought for that power, nor the Constituent Assembly never wanted that power should be given to the, either to the legislature or to the president of it. Therefore, sir, unfortunately this has happened. And what was the recommendation of the law commission? Not law commission, sorry. National commission to review the working of the Indian constitution. This constitution was reviewed by the national commission to review the working of the constitution in the year uh, 2002. The report was placed in 2002, and it said, and I quote two, three lines, sir, with your kind permission, quote, it would be worthwhile to have a participatory mode with the participation of both the executive and the judiciary in making recommendations. The commission proposes the composition of the collegium, which gives due importance to and provides for the effective participation of both the executive and the judicial wings of the state as an integrated scheme for the machinery for the appointment of judges. What could be noble, better, noble idea better than that? The commission accordingly recommended the establishment of a national judicial commission, and we have seen the fate of the national judicial commission. The Justice Bharma, sir, I'm coming. <laughs> Five minutes, ten minutes, I may want to... Some, some other speaker may speak. No, let it be. Okay. Let it be continuous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you kindly pardon me, because it's a very really important subject, sir. Two minutes before we conclude, then the other speaker will say. After the kindly judgment, after the kindly judgment, both are judgments, sir. Take it, take it. Oh, my dusra din, my baki judgment, oh, my dusra din, place karunga. It is salient points, oh, hai. Oh, my. Oh, my place karna chata hoon aapke saamu. Aap mujhe conclude karna mat boli aaj. Me conclude karna. Kipaya, kipaya. Kyunki, do ghanthe ka samay hai. Usme, 
दूसरा स्पीकर दो मिनट भी बोल लेगा तो फिर वो कंटिन्यू करेगा फिर आपको रिप्लाई करने के लिए समय मिलने वाला है and after his retirement we some of our members of this house who were in the department related parliamentary committee of uh, personnel public grievances law and justice we had the opportunity to meet him as a witness he came to us to this committee to give his evidence on the portion of uh, on the bill of lokpal then he said and in other places also he said it is on record and i quote two three lines late justice varma said my 1993 judgment has been both misunderstood and misused the main architect who gave back to this typical uh, collegium formula therefore some kind of rethink is required on my judgment and the appointment process of high court and supreme court judges is basically a joint or participatory exercise between the executive and the judiciary both taking part in it now simply some people may claim that it is still there this is a participation of both executive and judiciary but no what you but will come from the judiciary that will have a binding effect on the executive and the head of the state the president of india he is to he is bound by the recommendations of the judiciary he cannot have any other option therefore sir because there is limited time i would like to say many things because there are so many articles there how this consultation word have been used and in what context and how the court has interpreted those this particular word in a particular case if the other authorities if the other authorities claim that when my consultation is required for something that is that will have a binding effect on the president of india then we are going to denigrate the position held by the president of india under the constitution this is why sir i want that this debate should be continued this matter should be discussed again and again and this issue must be kept alive and at that and the government ultimately must intervene to address the problem because already it has come on the surface press conference is being held something is being said which is not very healthy for our democracy and for today i have may referred certain uh, views of our constituent assembly members and the next time when i'll get the opportunity either for the reply or for my, for continuation of my speech i will try to place before you sir to you sir to this house the how the constitution has been rewritten constitution has been rewritten not by the parliament but outside the that we i would like to establish in my next submission to you before this august house thank you sir dhanyawad shri ranga sai ram